Hello, BookTube, and welcome back to a series of videos in which I'm reading you a book. We are reading the Gospel according to St. Luke, uh, my favorite gospel, in the King James translation, and we are up to chapter 7. Now, when he had ended all his sayings in the audience of the people, he entered into Capernaum. And a certain centurion's servant, who was dear unto him, was sick and ready to die. But when he heard of Jesus, he, that is the centurion, sent unto him the elders of the Jews, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. And they, when they came to Jesus, they besought him instantly, saying that he, that is the centurion, uh, was worthy for whom he should do this. For he loveth our nation, and he hath built us a synagogue. So this Roman centurion has done favors for the local Jewish community. That's why they're willing to speak on his behalf. Then Jesus went with them. And when he was now not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying unto him, Lord, trouble not thyself, for I am not worthy that thou shouldst enter under my roof. Wherefore neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee, but say a word, and my servant shall be healed. For I also am a man under authority, having under me soldiers. And I say unto one, Go, and he goeth, and to another, Come, and he cometh, and to my servant, Do this, and he doeth. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him and turned him about, that is, Jesus turned around. <laughs> Luke has the same problem with pronouns that all these gospel writers do. Jesus turns around to the crowd that has gone with him. Uh, and said unto the people that followed him, I say unto you, I have not found so great a faith, no, not in Israel. And they that were sent, returning to the house, found the servant whole that had been sick. And it came to pass the day after that he went into a city called Nine, and many of his disciples went with him, and much people. Now when he came nigh unto the gate of the city, behold, there was a dead man carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and much people of the city was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her, and said unto her, Weep not. And he came to the, and touched the bier, and they that bore it stood still. And he said, Young men, I say unto thee, Arise. And he that was dead sat up and began to speak, and he delivered him to his mother. And there came a fear on all, and they glorified God, saying that a great prophet is risen up among us, and that God hath visited his people. And this rumor went of him forth throughout all Judea, throughout all the region round about. And no doubt, because this isn't like healing lepers or people with palsied hands, Jesus is walking into a city as a funeral procession is coming out of the city. Someone dies in the city. You put them on a platform, a bier, it's carried by a bunch of people. You are usually draped in a cloth, but your face is usually visible. You're covered in flowers. You are walked in a slow procession out of the city to the tombs along the road. Jesus encounters one of these things, probably a common sight in the ancient world, stops the procession and tells the dead young man to come alive again in front of lots and lots of people, not only his, his own disciples, but a crowd of people that followed him and the whole crowd that was coming out with the funeral procession who didn't know him from Adam. Uh, naturally, word like that is going to spread. You'll notice that is a completely different kind of miracle than the one done with the centurion's beloved servant, which is all done behind doors. If you weren't there to hear Jesus, Jesus doesn't even say your servant is healed in this version. He doesn't even say that and never meets the centurion face to face. So that's a very private miracle. You could miss that. But this, this would have hundreds of people talking about it for the rest of their lives. Uh, and the disciples of John, that is John the Baptist, showed him of all these things. And John, calling unto him two of his disciples, said unto, said, sent them to Jesus, saying, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? When the men were come unto him, they said, John Baptist hath sent us to thee, saying, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? And in the same hour he cured many of their infirmities and plagues, and of evil spirits, and unto many that were blind he gave sight. Then Jesus answering said unto them, Go your way, and tell John what things ye have seen and heard, how that the blind see, and the lame walk, and the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised, to the poor the gospel is preached, and blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me unbelievably interesting. In the previous two Gospels, John the Baptist, who we get more about his personal story from Luke than anybody, in the previous two Gospels, John the Baptist knows who Jesus is. He knows that, that he has been sent to make straight the way of the Lord, and one is coming after me who will baptize you in fire and the Holy Spirit. 
in this, John is alive. He's in prison. He can't go himself. He's alive and sends his servants to ask Jesus, are you the one? And Jesus tells them, go and say that I am. That's uh, pretty fascinating. And again, like so many other little nuggets that are lodged in the Gospels that we're reading, it points to a vast oral or literary tradition of which we have almost nothing. Were Jesus and John in one of those traditions rival prophets? I, we know that there are people who are associated with John. We saw in the last chapter that some people are saying John's followers fast and eat abstemiously. You don't. So John's followers are still around, and he is still around, asking, sending his followers to Jesus and saying, are you the Messiah? Makes you wonder what Luke was doing with all of that preparatory material about, about Elizabeth and the babe that leapt for joy in her womb at the mere sound of Mary's voice. But anyway, let's continue here. And when messengers of John were departed, he began to speak unto the people concerning John. So they all know him. The crowd all knows John. He made a huge sensation before Jesus came along. What, what went ye out into the wilderness for to see? A reed shaken with the wind? But what went ye out to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they which are, go are gorgeously apparelled and live delicately are in king's courts. But what went ye out to see? A prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and much more than a prophet. That is he it, of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. For I say unto you, among those that are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. But he that is the least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. And all the people that heard him, and the publicans justified God before being baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves, being not baptized of him. So again, Jesus is telling the crowd, John is the greatest of all born of women. I might point out Jesus himself was born of women, but uh, not born of man, but definitely born of women. Uh, but he's telling people, he's not the guy, I'm the guy. Which, again, speaks to an, a, a period at the very earliest parts of the formation of what we now call Christianity, about which we know virtually nothing. I, I just think, uh, I think it's fascinating. Uh, and also we get a little detail here as to why, we've mentioned a few chapters now, why some people, when they hear Jesus or see his miracles, are not moved. This passage seems to indicate that everyone who's baptized by John, or at least open to the message of John's baptism, will hear, and that the ones who reject that message will not, which is pretty interesting. Uh, because we don't know. We know in Luke, anyway, in the world of Luke, the self-contained world of Luke, we know barely any of the preachings of John the Baptist. And yet it sounds almost here like that's a prerequisite to salvation. Uh, but let's, let's move on here. And the Lord said, Whereunto shall I liken the men of this generation? And to what are they like? They are like unto children, sitting in the marketplace, and calling to one another, and saying, We have piped unto you, and yet ye have not danced. We have mourned to you, and ye have not wept. For John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and ye say, He hath a devil. The Son of Man is come eating and drinking, and ye say, Behold, a gluttonous man, and a wine-bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners. But wisdom is justified of all her children. And one of the Pharisees desired him that he should eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat at the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment and stood at his feet behind him weeping and began to wash his feet with tears and did wipe them with the hairs of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, he spoke within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he saith, Matthew, say on. There, and this is Jesus saying, There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed five hundred pence and the other fifty. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave bo them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thy house. Thou gavest me no water for my feet. She has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. 
Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman, since the time I came in, hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil, thou dost not, thou dost not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, Thy sins are forgiven. Notice, this got him into trouble just a few chapters ago. Only God can forgive sins. And he said unto her, Thy sins are forgiven. And they that sat at meat with him began to say within themselves, Who is this that forgiveth sins also? And he said to the woman, Thy faith has saved thee. Go in peace. Aside from the healing and resurrection miracles, we see something in this chapter that Luke wants to underscore throughout his gospel, which is that a new thing is being preached here, and it's happening right now. It's not that a prophet has come along with a new word, although that business about being foremost in the kingdom of heaven, that business about caring for others, about loving unconditionally, about the ones who have sinned most will be the most grateful for salvation instead of the most damned. All of that is new. But it's not just that. It's that it's happening now. I'm not a prophet of this word. I am the word. And it's happening right in front of you, right now. That, mo that note of imminence is wonderful in Luke. He hardly ever lets it go. And he stresses it where the other Gospels, the two that we've read so far, do not, or only lightly do. And I just love that. Absolutely love that. Jesus is at the house of a Pharisee. And the world that he is bringing, the word that he is bringing to the world, has shifted the balance of what that Pharisee knows. That Pharisee's world says, this woman and her ilk are to be scorned. They are to be spurned. They are the least of the least. And Jesus has come to invert that whole table. The least shall be first. The ones who are, who, are, who are the most sinners will be the most grateful for salvation. I came to heal the sick, not the healthy. That we don't ever, we don't ever get the Pharisee's reaction to what's going on here in his own house, unfortunately. But it's wonderful to conjure with. Absolutely wonderful to conjure with. This is not yet a fire-breathing Jesus. We, we get the sense as the narrative progresses and it becomes more antagonistic that he will become more antagonistic. But right now, no. The closest he comes to antagonistic in this chapter is to say to the people, once John's servants have left, but John's the ba John the Baptist's name has been brought up. They all know John. He's recent memory. He is still alive. Once his name has been brought up, Jesus f feels that he has to take them to task a little and say, what did you go out into the wilderness to see when you when word was spreading to every town and village that this, this locust-eating prophet was out in the wilderness? What did you go to see? Well, now you're seeing something else, something far more than a prophet. That, that kind of paradigm-breaking newness is all over Luke, just all over Luke. We can... We can debate until the cows come home. We don't need to debate in this series, but we could debate until the cows come home why that is present, why that element is so true. Could it be, for instance, that that element is being stressed because Luke is intentionally writing his gospel to a Gentile audience? That's not going to want to feel like they need to steep themselves in Mosaic law in order to get this. Or not. It doesn't matter because we're not doing any kind of uh, literary analysis here. We're just looking at the chapter, and that is what we're getting in this chapter. A figure who is hitting a consistent note. Not only that the world has changed, but that the change is happening right now. Uh, so we'll, we're in the midst of it. We'll just keep going next time. So I'll wrap this up for now, and I will see you then. Thank you, BookTube.